Good morning, you live. You guys awake? I saw how Pastor had to cheer you on to wake up, so I'm just hoping you're awake now. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, hey, wake up. Now turn to your second choice and tell him, wait, you wake up too. <laughs> Listen, uh, my name is Milton Guardado. I'm the youth director for New Life Fellowship, and I'm just excited to be able to be with you guys uh, this morning. Uh, I want to thank pastors for letting me be, uh, letting me be able to share the message tonight. Uh, today, we, we are celebrating our uh, graduates today. And so, yes, give it up for all the graduates. Amen. Amen. And maybe you didn't do it today, but, you know, keep going, keep doing it, and there's going to be a time for you. Amen. And so we have, our, we have doctors. We have uh, people graduating from college. We have uh, people uh, graduating from university, high school. And so we're going to be honoring them today. And so we're very excited about that. And so because we were talking about, uh, we're, we're talking about graduation and we're talking about uh, fulfilling a, a mission. That's what we wanted to talk to you about today. Uh, we want to talk to you about fulfilling your mission. And even though you're not graduating today, even though uh, you might not be walking and getting a diploma during this season, we want you to know that there is still a mission for you to accomplish. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and tell him you got a mission. Amen. All right. So, uh, it says here, God wants to restore your identity and purpose and guide you towards his plan for your life. Amen. So we want to talk about um, the process towards fulfilling your mission. Amen. And so um, there's, a, there's a passage in the book of Exodus chapter 3. Um, and most of the verses, you're going to find them here. But if you have your Bibles, go to Exodus chapter 3. And there's a, there's a big verse there. There's a, I'm going to do a little reading and you can follow along with me. But just to prep this a little bit, uh, Moses, the Bible talks about Moses and how uh, Moses used to be the prince of Egypt. A lot of you, if you've ever seen the cartoon, you've ever seen the story, he used to be the prince of Egypt and uh, he was born Jew but is raised as a prince. Uh, he, he fled because he killed somebody uh, and, we, and he fled and he, he was trying to hide because after he killed that, uh, that Egyptian, now his life was in danger. He fled into this place and far away and, and all of a sudden now he gets married with a, with a woman who wasn't uh, part of the Israelite culture. Um, his father-in-law had him tending the sheep. And so here is Moses just hanging out in the, in the wilderness tending sheep. And while he's out there, the Bible says that there was a bush that began to be on fire. And while it was on fire, it, the, the, what's, what's crazy about this bush is that it wouldn't consume. It wouldn't burn up. And so it caught Moses' attention. And so Moses went up to this bush, and it was God trying to talk to him and grab his attention. And he began to speak to him. Now, now verse 5 says this. It says, do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Now let's read for verse 7. Verse 7 says this, The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt, and I have heard them crying because of their slave." They're slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptian and to bring them out of that land into good and spacious land. Let's go to verse 11. Verse 11 says, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will, worship, uh, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to, Israelite, to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Verse 14 says, God said to Moses, I am who I am. Say, I am who I am. It's not Popeye. It's God talking right now, right? It says, this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. Let's pray. Father, we know you have a word for us today. I pray that you would speak to us, to change us, to challenge us, God, 
to move us from where we are today. Father, that we would begin to live, God, according to the mission and the calling that you have for each and every one of us. Changes and challenges today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so in order to go through the process towards fulfilling your mission, you have to understand three things. The number one, the very first thing is that you have to understand that God will always reveal himself to you. He will reveal himself to you. And so right here where the Bible talks, Moses comes up to God. And God shows up in a way that he reveals himself as holy. Now, you have to understand this, that, that God made sure that, uh, that Moses understood the very first thing that he needed to know about God was that God was holy. In other words, there needed to be reverence and honor when he came into his presence. And, and the truth is that the God of Moses is still the God of today. And God today is still holy. And, and it's funny because we, when, when, we, when we hear about Moses, Moses had to hide his face to come into presence of God because he says, I'm not worthy to be within your presence, God. But yet a lot of us, when we make our, when we make our preparations to come to church, it's almost as if we're not going to visit a holy God. It's, it's become very ordinary and mundane to be able to come to church. We almost see church as like going to a party or like, or like going, to, going to a game or going to, uh, going to a different place. But the truth is we are coming into a holy place. There should be something within us that should, that should want to have some, some kind of awe towards God's presence. We should be reverent to what God is going to do here today. And, I, and I'll tell you what, if we believe that God is holy, we would not just show up the way we come. We would be, we would be expecting God to do something. We would be waiting for miracles. We would be expecting of him to do something powerful in our kids' lives. We would come knowing, God, we're not worthy of what you're about to do. God, I, I, I know that you're holy, so I need to be careful how I walk into this place. And so here is, here is God. He tells them, he reveals his holiness. You need to change your composure when you come around God. And, 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 so, and so the second thing is that God reveals his identity to him. Begins to tell him who he is. And he, he reveals his identity. He says, he says, who has sent you? He says, I am who I am has sent you. In other words, that's the, that's the, uh, the Hebrew word for that is, is Yahweh which means action. And, and so in other words, in other words, God is telling him, tell them that I have sent you. I am Yahweh. I am, I am that God of action. In other words, if, if you're captive, I will set you free. If you're sick, I am the one that will heal you. If you're broken, I am the one that will piece you together. If you're broke, I'm the one that will bring you provision. If you're facing difficulties, I'm the one that's going to help you. If you're in doubt, I will bring you peace. In other words, when God was saying, I am, he's saying, I am all that you need. I, I, am, I am more than enough. You don't need to go look for somewhere else to be satisfied because I will be your everything. He says, I am who, who I am. I'm God. In, in the Bible, he was, revealing, he was revealing that he is still present and active. Now, something you have to understand is that uh, by this point, these Israelites had been enslaved for about 400 years. And so I, I don't know if there was doubt. I don't know if there, was, if there was people saying, well, maybe he forgot about us. But God was reminding them that he is still present and active in their life. He's saying, listen, I still want to express my faithful love. He, he's saying, I, I want to remind you that I want a relationship with you. He's trying to tell them that what I promised your parents many years ago, I will fulfill it through you. And this is who God was trying to tell him. Listen, I want to tell you that the same God that revealed himself to Moses is the same God here today. And I don't know what you're going through. But this God of provision, he's, he can be the God of your provision. You're looking for peace. He can give you peace. I, I don't know what your situation is. I don't know if your parents are about to get divorced or, or maybe you're coming into, into a place where you're like, man, this is too hard. I, I, I see a lot, of, a lot of crazy stuff in my neighborhood. I don't know what's going on, but I want to tell you that God can be enough for your life. God continues to be present and active today. You will not stand alone. This is what Isaiah 43, 2 says. It says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep you over. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Now, 
Now, you, you have to understand that it, it is important that God reveals his identity to Moses. It's important that, 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 that Moses understands that God is still all-powerful. It's important that Moses understand that God is still capable, that God is still great, and that he's almighty. Because then it leads us to the second point, that he equips you. He equips you. If you're taking notes, the second point is he equips you. Now, when God begins to reveal his identity, there, there is uh, that, that word when he says, I'm the father of your ancestors, of your generations. Now, that, that has a lot, a lot of information in itself. Because what God is saying, he's, he's talking to an educated man. Moses grew up in a palace, educated. He, 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 had to, he had to know the history and the story behind the people he was governing over. So Moses was, was, well, he, he was well informed about the history of, of, the, of the God of, of Abraham, of the God of Jacob, of the God of Isaac. He knew the story. He knew the, the history. He knew the pacts that they had made. He knew what it required to be a child of God. He knew what it required to become someone who's going to follow this God. So he understood how important these pacts were, how important circumcision was to Abraham, and how this was supposed to be Something that's for every single generation because it marked them forever and it marked them as God's people. And so all these pacts, Moses was well informed of. He, he knew what God's expectations of were for him. And so not only that, but when God reveals, when God reveals himself when he, to, be, to equip Moses, God reveals that Moses' identity is only found in God. His, his identity, see, who was Moses before that? Moses, he could have said, well, I'm a prince. What am I doing over here? Slaving over these, you know, working with these, these sheep. I lived in a palace. You know, that was, that's what Moses could have said. Or, or man, I, you know, man, Moses killed a man, right? And so, so he's, now he's hiding and he's an outlaw. And so Moses' perception of himself could be, man, I'm an outlaw. I, I killed a man. I, I'm over here hiding, man. I, 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 I don't belong to be in God's service. But this is, this is what's crazy, is that there's a difference between who you are through your own eyes, through your own perception, and who, who God sees in you. Now, I was reading this book called Visioneering, and Andy Stanley says that there's three identities that we have. And, and the first identity is who we think we are. We have a perception of who we think we are. We have, a, we have an idea. When we, when we think about ourselves, we have an idea of who we are. We think about it, and that's who we become. And so there's the perception of who we are. We see our, we have our own perception of ourselves. We have doubts and insecurity, and, and it clouds the real picture of what God sees. Now, the second identity is who people say we are, right? People talk about us all the time, don't they? And they have an idea of, of who you are. And what's crazy is that a lot of times we allow people to tell us, to give us our identity, they tell us you're ugly, they tell us you're fat, they tell us you're this, they tell us you're that. And they tell us all these things. And instead of, instead of like saying, dude, that's not who I am, we accept it and we become sad and we become very, we, we become so, you know, uh, you know we, we become sad and it deteriorates our, our emotions and we, our self-esteem gets attacked. And we, and we allow those things to take a toll into our lives because we, we allow people to tell us who we are. Our true identity is who God knows we are. You see, you see, Moses was an outlaw. Moses was nobody. But God was calling him out to be a deliverer of the nation. See, God was saying, Moses, listen, I don't care about your past. I don't care where you've been. I know all those things. I, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to remind me of who you were. I'm trying to tell you who you are and who I'm calling out and who I'm calling you out to be. And the same thing is with you. Listen, I know you're here. And I know you bring a lot of baggage, and I know you bring a lot of problems, and I know you allow, your, you allow your past to try to dictate who you are. But God is saying, man, forget the former things. See that I'm doing something new. Yeah. Allow God to tell you who you are. Allow God to form your identity. Allow God to demonstrate who you're supposed to be rather than listening to the naysayers, rather than listening to people who don't even care about you, that, that don't even love you, don't want to see you grow, and they're trying to tell you who you are. 
stop listening to them. Shut them out and say, God, who have you called me to be? What, what, what do you desire from me? You see, when, when God sees you, he sees you as someone that's more than an overcomer. He sees you as someone who's a worshiper. For some of you, I know you failed and you're about to go through eighth grade again, but God sees you as a good student. He sees you as a good student. He says, look, look, you're not only going to graduate, you're going to be a doctor one day. And you're looking at God like, man, me? God, me? Man, I missed half of the school last year. How am I going to be a doctor? But God is like, because you don't look at yourself through your own eyes. Don't look at yourself through what other people say. Man, I know you messed up. I know you got suspended 10 times last year. But God is like, dude, I don't care about all that right now. I care about what I see in you. I care about what I want to do through you. And God is ready. God is ready to forgive your past if you are. You have to, we talked about this on Wednesday, you have to be able to forgive, allow God to forgive you. You have to allow God's grace to forgive you and cover you. You see, you, you have to allow God to say, change my current situation. Where I'm at today is not what God has called me to be. Some of us, we've come today and we have an image of ourselves. And, 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 and you know what? You probably feel bad about it. You're like, man, I'm nothing right now. I'm not, I'm not doing anything. I'm not, I'm not doing what I, I know God's called me to be, God called me to do. But you know what? It's okay. God has called you to be a man of God. God has called you to be a woman of God. Listen, listen, you might not be acting like it right now. But you are a man of God. You are a woman of God. God has called you and he's purposed your life for something. You're not an accident. You're not an accident. God, God has great plans for your life. He desires great things for you. And so, if we don't understand who God is, we'll never understand who we are. If God is not everything in your life, then you'll never be able to see yourself through his eyes. If God, if God is not who you please, if God is not the one that you serve, if God is not the God of your life, then you'll never be able to see yourself complete. You always lack something. And then the verse says this. Exodus 4 says this. Moses answered, what if they don't believe me or listen to me? The Lord did not appear to you. Then the Lord said to him, what is that that's in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it to the ground. Moses threw it to the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. Moses reached out. And took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of the fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. What is in Moses' hand? What, What? See, whatever was in Moses' hand was something ordinary. It was a staff. It was a stick. It was something ordinary. And God had a way of using something ordinary and turning it into something powerful. My question is, what is in your hands? What do you have to offer God? See, ladies, you might look at your kitchen and you might see, I just got a stove in there. You know God can turn something ordinary and turn it into a mission. That stove can be something that you use, your tool that you use to to feed the hungry. And now you're using it for God's glory. See, you, you walked into a kitchen and you just saw a stove. You're like, dude, this is just a stove. This ain't nothing. But when, but when you begin to realize who you are in God's eyes and you're in God's hands, God says, that's not just an ordinary stove. That's a ministry. <laughs> you see, what is in your hands that might seem ordinary to you, but God wants to use it as a powerful tool? Some of you got a car, and you're like, it's just a car. It's an old beat-up car. Man, that's somebody's transportation of church. What's in, what's in your hands that you see as ordinary? Man, I don't know what you have. A lot of us, all we do is like Moses, make excuses and say, God, God is because I can't. And God is because I can't talk. And God, you see how Moses, all he kept doing was making excuses and saying, God, I can't do this. I can't do that. And God says, man, give me that stick you got there. He's like, this stick, you know. This, what is, this is just a stick. He's like, that's just a stick in your hands. In my hands, it's something powerful. See, y'all got, y'all got some talent in your hands that you haven't even developed yet because you're afraid of it. You're afraid of what it can become. You're afraid. See, some of you 
are afraid to develop that talent because it's going gonna, it's gonna to commit yourself to something more than just being asleep or, you know, wasting your time. See, committing to a talent means practice, means time, means development. Some of y'all are afraid of the work. And God is like, man, give it to me. Stop making excuses. I can do more with it. I can do more with it than you can alone. You see, I don't know what your talent is. I don't know what, you were, what you're gifted at. But God can use that. Some of y'all, you're gifted at playing a sport. That's not an accident. For, to, to the regular world, everybody sees it as a way of income, a way to make income or a way of entertainment. But in your hands, once you give it to God, God says, I'm going to use that to win your friends. See, they didn't come to church, but they'll go play ball with you. And you're like, see, something ordinary, God wants to turn it into something powerful. What is it that you have that you can say, God, this is just something ordinary. I, I like to do this, it's something ordinary, God. I, mean, I never thought of anything. But what's in your hands that God can turn to use for his glory? And so, and so God wants to develop that. And so use your gifting to your full potential. What's crazy is that some of us are afraid of what people might say when we're trying to develop a new gift, new talent. We're afraid of how, how bad we're going to look when we first get started. I was sharing this in the morning, and we have some uh, some students that that do the worship in in our youth service. And when they when they first started playing, there's four of them. When they they're not here, right? So I could talk about them. <laughs> they're not here, so they, I could talk all I can. Just don't watch the videos. All right. Uh, when uh, when they first started playing, they started they, they, about two years ago. They they began playing. They were real insecure. They were shy. They didn't know if they could play. They came together. I said, hey, we need somebody to play worship, so y'all going to have to do it. And so they started playing, and I'm going to be honest with you. They sounded bad. <laughs> that's messed up. I know. You're like, dude, that's wrong. See, that's why we don't practice. That's why we don't try out. They didn't sound good at all. They didn't sound good. And I remember, I remember sitting down with them and I, after the first service, the first time they ever played together. I sat down with them, and I said, what do you guys think about today? And they're like, you know, they weren't going to say it. <laughs> so I said it for them. <laughs> I know you're saying, dude, you're sorry. You're a terrible person. I know. I know. Whatever. I don't care. And so <laughs> somebody got to do it. So I told them, I said, guys, honestly, it was pretty bad. And they, they go, oh. I said, but, but you're going to be, you're going to get better. You're going to practice, and you're going, you guys one day are going to sound amazing. But you have, to, you have to, I want you to focus on what happened today because great things happen from small beginnings. They always come out from small beginnings. Great things don't happen overnight. They happen in the cumulative of time. And so I told them, and, and, and if you came last week, you heard, you heard them. Man, they sound amazing. These kids sound great. They sound good now, but it just didn't happen overnight. It took a lot of practice. It took a lot of them developing their own talent. The truth is that a lot of people are scared to showcase their talent because they're afraid that people are going to laugh at them. They're afraid that people are going to talk about them. They're afraid that, that they're not going to measure up to everyone else. See, what happens is we try to compare ourselves to other people. Stop comparing yourself. You're always going to fall short when you compare yourself to someone else. You know why? Because there's always someone that could do what you do better. Always someone. you can, Man, there's, there's, there's someone that can play better basketball than you. There's someone that can always play better drums than you. There's someone that can play the guitar better than you. There's always going to be someone better. So why even attempt to compare yourself? Stop comparing yourself and say, God, I'm just going to be faithful to what you gave me. Okay. I can't be faithful for my, my neighbor's talent. I can only be faithful for what you gave me. I'm going to develop what you give me to the, to the most, to the best that I can. And you know what happens after you develop your gift? You got to teach someone else so they can take your job. That's a, that's a different message, though. But you got to develop yourself. You got to develop yourself, and you got to give your job away. You know why? Because then you feel entitled. You're like, no, this is my job. No, this is my position. This is my place. Never mind. We'll talk about that later. Develop your talent. Give it away. Don't compare yourself. Then the, then the next passage says this. It's verse 10. It says, Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, 
Lord, I have, been, I'm, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? It is, not, is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will speak and I will teach you what to say. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. Look, look, stop making excuses. If God, if God is sending you to it, he's going to teach you how to do it. He's going to prepare you. He's going to put people in your path that are going to teach you uh, how to do things, teach you what to say, teach you what to do. Look, look, there's no excuse for not being involved in church. You know, and, there's, and if you say something like, man, it's because church was boring. It's because you're boring and you haven't found your mission yet. Because yeah. when you find your mission, you, there's no time to be bored. When you fully give yourself to God, there is no time to be bored because there's so much to do because there's so many more people to win. There's no way you can be bored. And so, you know, stop making excuses. Stop talking about what you can't do. You know, there's people that are always talking about what they can't do. Man, stop talking about what you can't do and start saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, it's not about you. It's not about your strength. Yes, alone, alone, yes, you, you're nothing. <laughs> alone, yes, you're sorry. Alone, yes, you're just, you're just, I don't know what you're doing. But with God, you become something else. Becomes powerful. Becomes anointed. And so don't disqualify yourself. Stop disqualifying yourself. That's what we do all the time. Somebody gives us an opportunity, and instead of saying, man, God, I'm going to do the best that I can, we start talking about, oh, man, I, don't, I really don't know if I can do that. I really don't know if I'm capable. I really don't know if I'm able to. Man, you know, we, you know, maybe God's calling you to lead a life group, and you're like, oh, man, it's because you don't know where I come from. You don't know my background. You don't know my education. Man, I don't got that much education, man. Or, or you know, whatever you're, we make excuses rather than saying, God, if, if, if you're giving me this opportunity, I know you're going to prepare me. I know you're going to equip me for it. And you know what? God can multiply and do crazy things with your life. Not because of you. It's never because of you. It's always because of God in you. It's because God has a way of taking the ordinary and making it powerful. And maybe you find yourself today and you're like, man, I'm just an ordinary person. What can God do with, with me? What can't God do with you? I believe with all my heart that God can qualify you. And number three. Number three, he sends you. Exodus chapter 4, verse 21 says this. It says, the Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord, uh, the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn. And I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn. And so here God is laying out the plan, the strategy, saying, man, Moses, he, man, he took a long time getting Moses on board. How many, times did he, how many times did he make excuses? How many times did he say, I can't? How many times did he say no? And now finally Moses is like, okay, I'm done, I'm, done, I'm, I'm down, I'm down, I'm down, I'm down. I'm in, right? Finally, you know, like that person you got to convince like ten times? To go with you, come on, man, it's going to be fun. Come on, it's going to be cool. Come on, everybody's going to be there. Come on. Who's going to be there? Come on, don't worry about it. Come on. And so you, it took a long time convincing. It took a long time convincing. But Moses is on board. Moses finally, I guess he starts believing God. All right, God, I'm in. I'm in. And so here is God. He's already revealed who he is. He's revealed his expectations. He's already said, Moses, this is who I am. And if you're my child, this is what I expect of you, right? And then the next verse kind of, I read this next verse and it, it threw me off. Verse 24. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. Crazy. Why is God going to spend all this time preparing this man? Getting him ready. He took a long time convincing him only to go kill him. That doesn't make sense. Does it make sense, right? I mean, I mean, this is Moses. This is the, the deliverer, man. This is the guy that, that, that parted the Red Sea. This is the Moses we're talking about that God was about to kill. You know why God was about to kill him? 
Do you, do you know why? Let's read that next passage, the next verse. It says, but Sephora took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are my bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At that time, she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. This is, what, this is what was going on. God had already revealed his plan to Moses. He said, Moses, you are my son. I'm going to use you. you. You're going to do all these things, all these great things. And Moses said, man, I'm down. Okay, I'm good. And God said, you got to fulfill the pact. You got to fulfill the covenant that we set before. You got to circumcise your son. He brought it to his wife. Had an argument. She was from, a, obviously she was outside of their culture. She was a Midianite. Said, you go to circumcise who? No. Nah. Not my kid. Uh-uh. Nah. We ain't gonna do it. And Moses, okay. <laughs> he didn't do it. And then while the whole time he hadn't done it, he hadn't obeyed, he hadn't fulfilled God's commission to him. And here is God and Moses trying to Moses trying to play it off. You know what I mean? He's still talking to God like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did all you told me to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, God, I did all that. You ready? You ready for tomorrow? I'm ready. I got my people. We're going to go in there. I'm, I, I, all right, cool. You did everything I asked you to do. I'm in, God. I'm in. I'm in. I'm good. I'm good. All right. So this is the plan. This is what you're going to do. This is what you're going to tell Pharaoh. Cool. On the road, God was about to kill Moses because he didn't meet the requirement. And the Bible says that his wife finally saw that this is real. <laughs> this just got real. God's about to kill my husband. So he, he, she, she finally realized, I better listen to God. And she circumcised her kid, threw the, threw the flesh at him, and God spared his life, barely. This is what I'm getting at. is that we need to meet God's requirements. No one is exempt. You know if Moses ain't exempt, you know you ain't exempt. You know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about? They made a book about Moses, you know? If Moses ain't exempt... I know I'm not exempt. If God can kill Moses, none of us are safe. <laughs> Meeting the requirements, it's about obedience to God. It's about understanding his holiness. It's about understanding who he is. It's about understanding his expectations for our lives. This is why God reveals himself first. So you don't have excuses later on when you're following him. See, once you start following them, you can't make those excuses from the beginning. Oh, I didn't know. Oh, my bad. You know what I'm saying? We, we, you can't make these excuses because I've already told you what I expect. I've already revealed myself to you. So why are you, are you falling below the standard? Why are you living below the expectation that I've already set for you? You're called, but you are replaceable. I don't care how talented you are. I don't care what your gift is. You're called, but if you don't meet God's requirements, you are replaceable. The Bible says that be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the victor's crown. In other words, when God talks about commitment, it's not something that you do from Sunday to Tuesday or Sunday to Wednesday. It's not just something that happens at life group. I go to life group on Wednesdays. I'm good for the rest of the week. The commitment to God is from when you decided to say yes to Jesus until you die. That means Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, to even Saturday. That day you want to sleep in a little bit. Even Saturday belongs to God. You know why? You know why? Because, man, we're messed up people. We're messed up people, man. All of us are messed up people. We all need Jesus every single day. There's not one person in this room that can say, I can do without God a couple hours. No. No, I don't care who you are. I don't care how you sing. I don't care what you play. I don't care what you do. I don't care what group you lead. I don't care how many times you've multiplied. If you don't have Jesus in your life every single day, you're worthless. You're nothing without God. You're ordinary. You're powerless. Just because you can legally do it doesn't mean you have the right to do it. You know that failing, failing is a process. Just like, just like serving God is a process. 
You know, nobody expects you to be perfect from one day to the other. There's a process to you restoring your life with God. There's a process, man. So, you know, for me, for me, serving God, maybe this ain't for you. This ain't the same for you. But for me, I had a problem cussing. Some of y'all are like, hermano, don't start judging me. Acting like you ain't got problems. <laughs> I see some of y'all on the road. <laughs> man, I had a problem cussing, man. I would say stuff and people would be like, I'm like, oh, my bad, man. I'm trying to, my bad, I cussed again. My, you know, and it's a process. But just like God is removing certain things in your life and there's a process for you growing, there's also a process in your failing when you start failing God. There's a process. It's noticeable. People see it. And what's funny is that people will call you on it. Leaders will call, call you on it. Pastor will call you on it. And what do we do? We get offended. Oh, why does he got to call me out? Doesn't he know about so-and-so? Why, why doesn't he tell her something? Instead of seeing, seeing it as an opportunity to grow, instead of seeing it as, hey, man, somebody loves you enough to tell you, we get offended and we say, we, we, we say, no, nah, you know what? Uh, nah, they're just always in my face. They're always in my grill. They're always telling me stuff. Uh-uh. Man, if we didn't love you, we'd let you just leave. We'd let you be like, dude, no one's going to tell you nothing. Just go. But because we love you, there's correction in your life. Right? The Bible says that a father who disciplines a child, he loves him. Right? He love, he only, dis, discipline only comes out of love. Right? They don't care about you. They won't say nothing. They're ready for you to fall. They're ready for you to mess up. They're ready to say, Shh, watch. Standing in the corner saying, watch. Oh, oh, watch, watch. See, I told you. Oh, you know? And then they blast your stuff everywhere. You know what I mean? And it's like, what about your stuff? You know, you're like, blast your own stuff. Don't blast my stuff. It's like that, man. But when people love you, they'll correct you. They'll call you on it. I like this passage right here, and I close with this. John 15, 1, 8 says, it says, I am the true vine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the world I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can, you, neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Verse 6 says, If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, my words remain in you. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My, uh, my dad, he, he, for, he cuts trees for a living. That's what he does. And ever since I was a little kid, we used to go work with him all the time. And there was times when, when, when the tree was rotted, that all we could do was just pull it out of the, pull the trunk out of the, pull the whole tree out of its root, right? Because it was rotted. It was no good. But there was some trees. I, my dad would go and trim the trees. And there was some of these beautiful trees had like dead branches hanging out, right? These dead branches that are like, leaning over like a house or leaning over a roof and, and so very dangerous it can collapse and break it break off at any time so my dad would go up there and he would cut these trees cut it at the root at the base of where the the, the dead the dead part begins and he would cut it would bring it down and then all of a sudden he'll, he'll spray this little spray on it and and that was like formula for it to heal again or whatever and and I think about that when I think about this verse because when when you prune something, it's because you want it to be healthy again. Because you want that, you want that branch to grow and, and fulfill its potential and bear fruit. Right? Otherwise, that dead part of the branch is killing its potential. So what do you need to do? You need to remove that dead part so that it can grow again. So that it can produce fruit. And you know what's crazy is that God does this, does this in our lives. He removes the stuff in our lives that isn't producing fruit. He removes stuff in our lives that, that isn't according to his will. But, but you know what we say? No, that belongs to me. That's part of me. I need that. That's part of who I am. And, and you know what? We've allowed dead things to identify us. 
We, we've allowed these dead things that haven't produced fruit. We've allowed them to, to distinguish us and to say, this is who I am. I've only found identity in this dead thing. When God is like, let me remove it from your life. Let me remove it. You're not becoming the person I've called you to be with this dead weight hanging on. Let me prune it. Let me remove it from your life so that from this moment on, you can begin to fulfill the passion, the mission that you were called to fulfill. Let me do that for you. That's what God wants to do today. He wants, to, he wants you to fulfill your mission. He wants you to fulfill your potential. He doesn't want you to be lost potential. He doesn't want, to, he doesn't want you to be a what-if story. He wants you to be someone who, who does everything God had called them to be. You know, we're, we're all the, the young people that are supposed to be doctors. All the young people that are supposed to be pilots. The young people that are supposed to be missionaries. The young people are supposed to be pastors. Where are they at? They never remove, allowed God to remove those dead things in their lives. Let God prune those things off your life. And let the healing begin. Why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes. He's making you better. Act like a disciple everywhere you go. Bear fruit that will last. Preach. And if you need to, use words. Father, today, there's many of us here, God, that haven't aligned, God, our, our mission with your mission, God. We haven't aligned ourselves, God, to who you are. We haven't aligned, God, our potential to your will. Father, I pray today you begin to prune the things in our lives that are causing us to fail. Prune the things in our lives that are causing us, God, to fall away from you. If you're here this morning, keep your, keep your head bowed, eyes closed. If you're here this morning and you would say, I've allowed some things to stump my growth. I haven't been fulfilling God's mission for my life. I haven't been living up to my full potential. But I want God today to remove some of those things from my life and become the person he's called me to be. If that's you this morning, you want to say, pray for me. Pray for me. I want to fulfill God's mission. If that's you this morning, Raise your hand right there where you're at. It's good, it's good, it's good. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. This is about you. This isn't about anyone else. Father, today, I ask for forgiveness, God, for each and every one of us in this room who have fallen short, God, who have not allowed, God, we have not lived within your standards, God, We've allowed things in our life to take, to consume us and to take over our identity, God. I pray that today, Lord, you would forgive us. Call us into your mission field, God. As we're being sent, God, remove the things in our life, God, that hinder growth. Help us, Lord. Remove it, God, and begin the healing process in us, Lord. So that when we begin to bear fruit, God, we can look back at the moment that you began to prune, God. You began to work in our lives. And we can give you worship and we can give you glory. We began to thank you, God. This is a starting point for many of us, Lord. Help us, God, that we would fulfill our mission. Allowing you, God, to reveal yourself to us. Equipping us, God. Sending us Father, we worship you. We thank you. Come on, let's 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 uh, let's sing the song one time, and then we'll, let's just stand up. Let's worship together one song, and then we'll move on to the next part of the program. Come on, let's stand up. Let's worship. <laughs>